Getting the early numbers could be the key to success when betting on the NFL. That's why we're here to react to the pinnacle openers and analyse where the market might move. Welcome to the opening line. Here we are. We're on to week five of the NFL. Uh, the odds are up. There's some upcoming actions. So, so now it's time to, to take a look at those early numbers at Pinnacle. As always, we've got our three expert NFL guests here with me once again, Eric Eager, Andy Molitor and Rufus Peabody. Um, Eric, I'm going to start with you. How's, how's week four been so far? Not too bad. I mean, we, uh, you know, there was the, I really liked the uh, the line movement I got on Cleveland, um, and then they, you know, obviously, uh, you know, won outright. At, you know, Baltimore was one again where you picked it up early in the week. Yeah, you, you got uh, you got a nice number. It ended up pushing at the end, or, or even losing. I think if you got fourteen and a half um, totals were still, as we talked about last week, just an, you know there was no regression there. I'll be interested to see what happens this week um, as well. But yeah, fun week. Uh, you know, one that we didn't know we were going to get even up until Sunday morning. And what about you, Andy? Similar? I know there was some consensus on the show last week. Is it is it a good week for you? Yeah. No, I had a winning week. I didn't have a lot of plays. It's the same kind of this week. It's been light so far, but uh, the Colts never in doubt. Ravens, honestly, Ravens probably should have covered the late number, but like Eric said, getting the 13 or the 13 and a half ended up mattering once they put in RG3. The corpse well, of RG3. <laughs> that was a that RG, was a RG3 throwing it to a Washington football team player for the first time in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and that was and that was that took it over the total too. The garbage touchdown flipped the total and took some people off the winner at, at the end. But you know, otherwise a good week. Vikings total I thought should have gone over earlier, but I avoided a bad beat because you don't get bad beats on overs anymore. It just doesn't happen. The points the points find a way. And uh, Rufus, I know you, you took a bit of heat for that Jets number that we talked about. How's the how's the rest of the week been for you? You know, I'm not sure you can call me an expert or anything, given uh, get, or at least in the NFL, given what I've been doing so far this season. But yeah, the Jets hurt. Uh, you know, I liked, I, I was on the Bears, um, but I, you know, early in the week, assuming Trubisky would play or hoping Trubisky would be the starter, you know, I, I ended up just staying with it just because I had a good number. Um, didn't didn't come through, but I won on the I won on Saints, won on um, Washington football team. Did uh, lost on uh, I, I took a little bit of Dallas at game time. You know I hate doing that, but I couldn't like that number. It just moved so much, and I, I was like I you know hard to resist, and and lost on Jacksonville. I mean losing week for me. Jets was my biggest play um, by a by a good margin, but but you, you know got, what? you got I a good still, number on that. Eat. I still have enough money for food. Well, you got a good number on the Jets. I mean, there's oh, that yeah. was just an absolute. Probably should have covered. Yeah, I, yeah, I fell asleep. I, I didn't see the end. I pulled up the score when I woke up. I'm like, oh, it was they didn't cover. And then I looked. I'm like, oh, gross. What do you guys think about this right now in the NFL? We talked, Andy. You were on my show last week. We talked about this with scoring being what it is. Even in a game like Jets Denver, which is lot, what the total was like 40, 41. Our key numbers less. I mean, our key numbers have to be worth less now, right? And and it's got to be frustrating in games like that where you do have a good number, you're covering, and obviously there's just the scoring is unbelievable now because of like the lack of holding, you know, being the chief uh, reason. Yeah, it's been a mess even in games where, God, I wrote this one down. The Jags Bengals went three for nine in the red zone, and that total was never in doubt. I mean, it, you, even teams where you're having huge red zone problems, which is usually how you end yep. up getting an under. I mean, I think first half over, second half over, game over, everything cashed in that. Like, they, I don't, I'm not sure they punted in that game. Like these, these, yeah. uh, they're finding ways to extend drives. I've, I have written down some numbers I haven't looked yet as far as first downs by penalty. I don't know if anyone has historical numbers on that. I haven't dug into it yet, but I don't, I don't just anecdotally, I feel like that's higher this year. Maybe I'm dead wrong on that, but it, it feels like I'm seeing a lot of that when I'm going through box scores. First down by penalties, there's like, shit, team got like five of those. What, what's well, the here? DPIs, right? I mean, yeah. I think that that's been the big increase. Well, and we're not not only – I mean, so the holding penalties are a thing, and I think Rob Pizzolo tweeted that out, and it was, I think, a really good insight that a lot of us had, you know, in our intuition seen happen. But the other thing is, now that offensive linemen know they're not going to be called as much – that there's not as much pressure on the quarterback. I mean, the only teams that have get pressure on their quarterback are like the Bill O'Brien Houston Texans, right? And like the really bad teams are allowing pressure on their quarterback. 
there isn't as much pressure too. So it's like, it's like a double effect of, you know, the, the, the change in the way the game's called where, you know, quarterback, you're not like what kills drives the NFL to your point, Andy, about no punts. It's holding penalties on, you know, first or second down and long and it's sacks, right? A sack is worth two points to the, to, you know, EPA basically every single time you're not getting second down and 18 that these teams have to dig out of. I mean, teams are ahead of schedule more than they've ever have been because you're not getting sacks. You're not getting holding penalties. And even if you do, you can get bailed out by a defensive pass interference. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Third, third and thirty, five yard penalty, first down on illegal contact. What was it? Um. Oh God, Wentz made a great play, and uh, you remember that 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 Wentz like getting out of pressure. It was kind of like you know, I I, I thought it was you know, he could have easily gotten sacked there, and it would have been an awful play. And you know, he completes the pass for whatever it was. It was on second and twenty two, but but. They take the yards in, or they take the, the penalty and he gets the automatic first down. But yep. Eric, I guess well, the, the question uh, for you, like you is said, Bill O'Brien, it's a quarterback stat. Like the teams that are going to take sacks are bad. You know, quarterbacks that hold it forever. Yep. You can only hold so long. Yep. Just on the like the holding and the penalties and stuff like this, how much, Eric, you kind of asked the question to start off with, but how much weight are you putting to it? Like we're now five weeks into the season. So how valuable is it and how much? focus are you putting on that kind of stuff so early on in the season i it's hard right i mean and you know both of you both of all of us can sort of talk about this but you know you know you can do all the things that you want in terms of like you know you can put in the but we it, it's not something that's been historically supported right so you know for uh, yeah i kind of did a back of the envelope calculation about you know what is a holding penalty worth what is a pressure worth and i've been over the first you know set, starting in week two i've just added you know, sort of like an additional year effect to this year um, for totals because, you know, and it be, because it's, it's sort of unprecedented. I don't know. What are you got? What is you guys' approach, you know, to doing this uh, this year? Because a modeling approach is going to struggle, I think, a little, a little bit because we, we just have, we don't have the data for, you know, these tails here. I mean, for, for sure. I actually, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to get my total stuff together this week, finally, but I, I haven't bet any totals all year yet, except for, for live bets and second half bets. But what I would do is generally, and, and what I do do, um, rather than take a position on where totals are going, is is I basically will scale my numbers to reflect the market, or if I think, you know, if if it's off, um, or to be, you know, I personally like it shading, you know, slightly to the under. So the under, you know, the average under is going to still be a loser, but just uh, less than the average over will. Um, but you know, I mean, I'm I'm seeing what about, you know. Penalties um, boosting offensive EPA by about two point, a little over two points a game um, over the 2018, 2019 baselines. Um, and, I, you know, I, it, I was hoping to have a chance to update that, you know, before this podcast, but I didn't. Um, I don't know if you guys, uh, like, I don't know anything. Were, were the penalties, was, was the same trend, did the same trend hold? I actually haven't looked either, but I, I'm, I'm assuming I know pressure rates were down again this week um, on the quarterback. Um, that, that was just something I was looking at. But I, you know, I'm in the same ballpark as you, about two and a half points um, that I was adding to totals just based upon um, what I was seeing. But, you know, I think I think it's another important point that, you know, you've always made in your podcast, Rufus, which is, you know, if you're you have to regress to the market and I think in, in many ways do so in a dynamic way. Right. Like there are some years where you know, so, you know, home field advantages like this year, home field advantage is weird too. And, you know, you have to be either more aggressive or less aggressive in how you, in how you regress to the market. I think with totals, it, it's similar, right? I mean, it, it, this year, I think you have to be more aggressive in addition to making some adjustments. Yeah. It's, it's tough because if you try to use priors or anything, which you still should be at this yeah. early in the season, you just, you're going to look at a lot of these and your numbers or, I mean, not even just your numbers, just looking at the numbers. And, you know, I'm so used to making my numbers all year last year. And we would, you know, Drew and I do that a ton where we say, this is where we think this totals can open. Cause we love totals, especially last year, had a lot of success with totals, especially off the openers. And, you know, we'd, we'd make numbers and we'd say, well, if we're off, we're going to bet it. And this year, yeah, I'm going to make a lot of these too high if I try to use just the way I've always done thing or anything, you know, considering my priors. So right now I'm I'm tiptoeing lightly. Like Wait, you're going to make them too high? 
No, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be making the opening numbers are all too high. Oh, okay. I was you know, like, well, it, it's gonna be hard okay. for me to. It's gonna be hard for me to bet a. Like honestly, it's funny because if I do the things I've always done, it's gonna be hard for me to bet an over. All these numbers are gonna open too high for me. Where it's like, oh, that's an under. That's an under. That one's right on. Whereas you know, how many unders really were there? Just uh, early, early slate. I think what Seattle, Miami was that one. It? I think there was like one or maybe yeah. in, in a push. I was looking at it at one point. I was like, thank goodness this isn't the week that I'm betting all the unders. As I, you know, as I said, I haven't bet any totals yet this year. No, no one's betting unders, I think. Um let's let's get on to our first game. We've got the Bears and the Buccaneers. Um, I think Pinnacle put Tampa Bay up at minus five. Um, they've already gone to minus five and a half. It is a relatively low total here at 44 points. Um, who wants to kick us off this week and, and tell us what they think of those numbers? God, I lean under. <laughs> like it's, it's an under game. Well, Tampa, Bay is, so Tampa Bay's game against the Chargers total, what, 42, 42 and a half? I mean, that game went over kind of, you know, it was a perfect storm for an over and that the favorite got behind on a defensive touchdown and then, you know, the the the, the door opened up. Um, Chicago is playing under, but again, they're a team that has shown the, the possibility of getting behind and then scoring, uh, you know, with both of their quarterbacks. Um, I don't know. I, this was a, on the look ahead. It was three, right? And and as it, yesterday's games pushed it out to this, pushed it out to six, and then back to five and a half. Um, I I kind of support the move away from six towards Chicago. It's probably a bit much at home, even with the way Foles. I think it's probably a hard recency thing. Foles looked pretty awful, but at the same time, how have you guys upgraded the indie defense? You know, they're not. It's not like the the best defense we've ever seen is some, I've seen somebody on Twitter say that, like, come on, it's, it's a very good defense, but at the same time, it hasn't, you know, they haven't had the high quality of offensive opponents yet, or they've caught the ones that they did play at the right times, but they played very well and Foles was underwhelming. It took, you know, garbage time to even get in the end zone. Honestly, that, that game probably should have just landed on three for the bears. And that's probably a reason why I lean to the under Tampa Bay looked really good defensively against Denver. I'm, I'm probably gonna. I'm probably not giving him any upgrade for Foles last week. I, I didn't. I didn't do a downgrade. I just kind of neutral on it. At the same time, like I don't know how I'm gonna upgrade this offense even at home. Tampa. This was surprising with Tampa. Brady wasn't sacked, and you mentioned that again. Pressure numbers are down. Like, I was sure I watched him get sacked. I found out he he did get hit five times. They hold the ball a little longer, and you know, in Arian's offense, but the fact that he didn't even get sacked, I'm. I, that was my big thing to harp on him this year down in that new offense was he's going to get hit a lot and it might not work out for him, but he was great. Like outside of that one horrific pick, he was pretty great against a uh, decent defense. So the, the number is probably a little high at uh, home, but I'm, I'm not touching it either way. And I'd lean under, which means I'm passing. Yeah. It, it's a game I'm not touching either at this point. I mean, I, I don't have it. Uh, I make it four. Um, you know, I think I was a little bit, a little bit high on Chicago going in, but, but regarding the Colts defense, um, I was just looking at some stuff, you know, they're number one right now in, in yards per play against, they're also best in the league in terms of, um, in terms of the average, um, well, I don't even know how to describe the stat, but basically they've had more field to cover than any other team on yep. average. So the average snap has been at, um, at the, well, on defense, um, has been taken at that that team's own like 38 point something yard line, which is like uh, or maybe it's 39 by, by three and a half yards. So I think it's, it's yes. One sort of begets the other, right? Because, you know, if you're going to, if you're, if you're stopping teams, you know, they're not going to advance the ball, but at the same time, it's a lot harder to, to defend a bigger field. Um, you can get more yards when you have a larger field. Whereas, you know, in the red zone, there's a cap on the yards and there's less area to defend. So I thought that's really impressive. Um, but then you look at who they played, right? Chicago, um, Jets, Jags, Vikings, like yep. all pretty much bought, I think we agree, bottom offenses. Yeah. So, yep. um, the, and the Bears were ranked worst in my game grades out of any team on offense last week. Um, Tampa, um, that was a game that was pretty even. Just interesting looking at the game grades. I had Tampa as a point better. They were they they were very, very good on offense. Um, and and not particularly uh, good on defense in terms of explosiveness. They, they gave up the, the big explosive plays to the Chargers, but they were actually very good in terms of um, in terms of holding uh, the Chargers to a low play success. 
I had the Chargers at only a 34.4% play success, whereas Tampa Bay was 56% on offense. So, um, so it, you know, I, you know, yes, that number moved up for me from where it was, um, but not enough. Like if it gets, I'll play it. Sure. I'll, I'll play Chicago if, if it gets to a touchdown probably, but uh, I'm not firing anything right now. Sounds like you, a- Rufus, that's such a good statistic. Um, it, it's, it's actually really characteristic of, of like Andy Reid teams where they give up more yards per play than they should, but they, they're good on special teams. They're good at their, their quarterbacks don't throw. So Rivers didn't play well yesterday at all, but he did not throw interceptions. And like they sort of controlled the game enough where the other team has to do a ton of, has to do a ton of work. And, um, and I think that that's, you know, um, you read right now. Is I that know. an important one? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, and, and so, you know, you look at that, you look at that and you think, okay, um, you know, that that's the mark of not only a good defense, but a good team. Um, one thing that I'll say about this total, Tom Brady leads the NFL this year in, in the number of passes he's had dropped. He leads the NFL this year in the number of our throws that are considered the highest, like, so we call them big time throws, which is, but, you know, sort of, it's like a way to try to redo touchdown interception ratio. The variance in Tom Brady's game is unlike we've ever seen it before. Um, and so when I look, you know, and that's exactly what manifests itself in the game uh, on Sunday against the Los Angeles Chargers was, you know, big plays, but also turnovers. And I, I don't know if that is conducive to an under anymore in his game. Sounds like a, a general stay away then, unless uh, maybe the Bears can pick up some more points. But as we just looking kind of down the slate, we've got a couple of games that are off, um, obviously, because of some of the action taking place tonight. I think one of the interesting things I saw is that Pinnacle did have Kansas City up at minus 12. Um, looking at the rest of the market, it seems like the consensus was that that number maybe should have been a bit higher. Um, before we get on to the other games that, that we've got the full numbers for, do you think what we could see tonight against the Patriots might sh- might see the, the Chiefs shift a little bit as well? Well, what was interesting to me was that last week, um, after the Monday night game, you didn't really see those numbers shift, right? I mean, um, and so, although now they have as a result of uh, Cam out. And you know what? I had I had Patriots. I had took Patriots plus seven before um, before the, the Monday night. It was Monday night, wasn't it? My memory yep. said that. Yeah, before the Monday night game. Um, and – you know, I thought I would be getting it would be no action since the game's moved, but it's you know it's a very much on a book by book thing. Are you there, are books? there are some books actually. I'm having to eat the majority of the action because I had a trader like um, it. I'm not even going to say a name, but there's one of the legal books in the U.S. that will still uh, that it says it has to be played within seven days. So that's uh, that's rough. Yeah, I, I, my, my Patriots at seven and a half. You know, the look ahead got canceled, um, and as did a, a play on the total. But yeah, it does, it does depend. But you were Rufus, like that was like sort of what you said last week, and I, I sort of disagreed, but I kind of came around, which was no matter you know how good the Chiefs play, that number like it could only go you know become better for you know New England, right? Like that could have gone all the way to six and a half. Had Kansas City laid the egg that some in the betting market thought they would against the Ravens. And the Chiefs played about as well as they could, and it didn't move at all. So there's a ton of respect. And you're even seeing that now, right? Like, uh, what would you guys – I mean, do, do you guys – what do you think of this number tonight? I mean, like, I I think it's 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 that showing a ton of respect in the betting market for Bill Belichick. Wait, what is the number now? Ten and a half? Ten and a half. Yeah, that seems – it does seem like it to me. It's tough for me because – you know, let's say it was last year and this happened and Tom, we had to go Tom Brady to Hoyer or literally any other team to like Hoyer. You have such a good baseline for that quarterback and you your delta between the two, you probably have a better grip on it. But the fact that we're still kind of figuring out how Cam fits in this offense and maybe we don't have a good grip on what the New England offense quite is yet. You know, was it what we saw in the second half against Seattle or was it some of the other stuff? So it, it's a tough adjustment. But at the t- same time, like we've had some some people brought up some pretty good stats. I don't, I'm sure I can't find them right away. But like the some of the Hoyer numbers, it's like, yeah, this is this is giving Belichick respect because this this should probably be a bigger downgrade for somebody of that age who just the the numbers he's put up uh, the last couple times he's had to start. Um, I'm worried about uh, this just being a terrible game on a Monday night. But the la- the last few times he had to start weren't with the Patriots. No, that's the other thing. Daniels, completely you know. different teams. 
it's it's hard. It's what makes this adjustment so hard. But I, I think just the way I would make it, probably it needs to be a little more. I'm half tempted by some uh, Kansas City first half, just as this offense tries to figure things out. Yeah. It was um it was quite an interesting point from you, Rufus, last week about how they might perform against the Ravens. And I don't know if you are you guys involved in any kind of futures tickets? Can anyone see past the Chiefs in terms of the Super Bowl? Or is there the kind of numbers out there that you liked and, and maybe still do despite what we've seen from them? I I don't know if I don't know if the Ravens or Steeler the teams from the AFC North I feel like are difficult value you know, difficult to price out just because I think the their matchup with the Chiefs is going to be is going to be superseded, you know, is going to supersede the power ranking difference. And I think we saw that when you're a team that relies on blitz and man coverage to beat teams, that is a tremendous, you know, approach against almost every single offense in the league. Uh, against Kansas City, it's really difficult. I do think the Colts, you know, the Colts and do play a sort of uh, a defense that can slow down the Chiefs because it's similar to the the Chargers and and the Niners. Um, so maybe maybe the AFC South, you know, the who you perceive the winner of that division to be maybe has more value uh, in the futures market than the teams in the AFC North. Yeah, I mean, I found I think the market is too high on the Chiefs futures just in general, just at least from a quantitative perspective. Um, Eric, I feel like I'm learning so much from you about football, though, here in the mashup stuff. Like, like I'm not into. Yeah, that's not the stuff that I think about as much. Um, but it's the it's it's harder to quantify right that's the mm-hmm. stuff that that sort of a math model is not going to really be able to hit on that well but i just think oh yes the chiefs are a great team but it's i think in general the great teams tend to be priced too high um in those futures markets with the exception of the patriots a few years ago uh because the patriots <laughs> people didn't think the patriots were as good as they were but yeah. I, the other thing you have to realize with remember is that there's there's all this injury uncertainty that could happen like yeah. You know, and not it's not just Mahomes, but like, you know, you know, what if one of their pass rushers gets hurt? I mean, there's all yeah. sorts of things, you know, offensive line. Um, and that's I mean, we're, we've already seen so many injuries this season. And so you, it's not who the team is now. It's who this team is going to be, you know, in the first round of the playoffs. And it might be a very different team. Well, and that was always the the thing with the Chiefs last year was. You know their injuries all happened quote at the right time, right? And then they got healthy and they won the rest of their games while other teams are sort of reeling. Um, the payoff, the payout at plus four hundred. I'm looking at Fanduel right now. It could be anything, but like the plus four hundred. There's there's simply to your point, Rufus, not enough of a payoff to to overcome the tail risk that is immense this season, right? Immense. Like Mm -hmm. if Andy, Andy reads what in the sixties, like if he gets sick, right? That's another, like, you don't want to wish these things on people, but like, you know, there, there's, there are like five days ago, we thought Cam Newton was playing Patrick Mahomes, you know, and, and it all like blows up in, in just a day. Right. And so I don't know, like, I think you look at Tennessee at plus 33, you know, 3,300 Indianapolis at plus 2,200. Those are kind of like, that's where I kind of want to look because again, like now I think you're properly pricing in like the tail risks of what can happen in the AFC. But we stand 150 to one. That, that, that's about, it's about to get easy. That schedule. Uh, can I ask you guys about the Colts though? Cause Phillip rivers, I mean, this is not something that I, I, I quantify, but like, it just doesn't seem like the Colts have the upside on offense or, or, or they don't have that ceiling on offense with rivers at quarterback. Do they? The receivers like, are banged be, yeah. up, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's a huge deal. Like they don't have Pittman, they don't have Campbell's uh, not coming back. Is yeah, he? But I, I just mean Rivers. Like with Rivers at your quarter, like as your quarterback, I don't think you can beat the Chiefs in the playoffs. It just feels that way to me, at least. Like the, the game, the game script would, like Eric said, the game script would be similar to what you saw with the with the Chargers the other week. They can play that style of defense. Their offensive line can hold off anything KC can throw at them from a pass rush. And basically, you just need a really good – you don't need like a perfect game for Phillip Rivers. You need him not to throw two picks. He just needs to be above average Phillip Rivers and they can hang with a team like that. It'd be tough because likely it's in Kansas City, depending on how you feel about home field. But they're they're kind of built – they're built to hang with a team like that. You just need a little variance. You the need only, a perfect game from the rest of the team, basically, though, right? Yeah. And, the and, defense has to play very like, well. You don't have a margin of error like you do if you had a quarterback with who could actually make correct. more plays. Well, the, and the, the only team in Patrick Mahomes' tenure in Kansas City that's held them beneath 20 points is Indianapolis last year in that Sunday night game with Jacoby Brissett starting. But the, the key was – with the, the key to beating Kansas City last year, the, the three te- the three 
AFC South teams that beat Kansas City all averaged 200 yards on the ground rushing. Um, and the tricky part was, you know, Tennessee and Houston were not good enough defensively on the back end to stop the Chiefs, you know, as you saw in the playoffs. But Indianapolis, and the Indianapolis is not the most talented team defensively, but what they do is they keep everything in front of them and they play a very disciplined, you know, to, to Andy's point about like the Chargers, where it's like they can get beat you up front with Justin Houston and DeForest Buckner. And on the back end, they're not getting burned the way that, you know, Baltimore was the other day where Baltimore basically, you know, rushed six and went five on five in the in the secondary. And the Chiefs are just too talented for that. And and the, the Steelers try to do the exact same thing. So and, and that works against almost every quarterback in the league except for Mahomes. And, you know, so that's where I really don't see the matchup working for the AFC North teams. But the AFC South, like you said, Rufus, I think if they play a perfect game, uh, I think it can really neutralize the Chiefs. Well, okay, so that's what sucks about beating the Chiefs. Yeah. Perfect game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I make the Chiefs fourteen point six percent to win the Super Bowl. That was going into that was going into this week, though. So we'll get on to to one of the other games in the slate. Then we've got the Rams against Washington. Uh, pinnacle is minus nine and a half on the Rams. Total of forty five and a half. Um, this one looks pretty straightforward according to the early action. But does anyone think those numbers are off, or or does everyone kind of think it, it should be pretty straightforward? Straightforward. Yeah. I haven't got too deep in the so my my box score autopsies. I haven't got to the afternoon games yet, and I'm not looking forward to getting to this one. It was a bet I had. I had eleven and a half, and it just looked like uh, and maybe you, I'd like your guys' opinion on this. It looked like the Rams were just kind of playing down or treating it as a scrimmage. Yeah, I kind of looked just lightly at the box score. I wasn't super excited about anything. They didn't uh, they didn't run the ball effectively. Golf was okay, and they. But, you know, they let the Giants kind of in it at the end. It was it was an ugly game. Like the, like you said, the 4 o'clock slate was super nasty to watch. The Gerald Everett fumble was gross. Did did New York turn the ball over? Did Yeah, Dimes had one, one interception. Threw an uh, interception there. New York yeah. turnover margin. Yeah, yeah. the, the turnover for- margin was zero. The I mean, what, what, it's hard. I haven't pulled out any of the drives yet. But yards well, for play, I'm guessing, was similar just because yeah. L.A. was super vanilla. The only thing I can really think of, if you want to go down Narrative Street, is the, you know, going to the East Coast, to the West Coast, to the East Coast, and then back to the West Coast again. Maybe the, the lack of time and some of the, the fatigue that that can grind on you, even early in the season. Maybe the they didn't put a big gas game plan together for a, a terrible team. I, Giants were 0 for 4 red zone, by the way, too. Yep. yep. And and turn the I mean, they drove twice on the Rams down eight and both times came up empty in the fourth quarter. I I was low on the Rams going into the season. So the only reason I watched that game is to possibly steal a loss uh, for the Rams. Um, Goff right now has performed pretty well, um, but his average depth of targets low. That means their margin for error is lower. Um, and in the first three in the first three weeks, what you saw was really good game planning by Sean McVay. I get a little nervous when the the correlations are a little off between the coach and the quarterback. You sort of want um, the equals there, and I don't think Goff is an equal to McVay. Which, when you go against Washington, you know Washington's is not impressive at all on offense, but on defense, I think that they give some teams some trouble. I think the Ravens were far more, less dominant yesterday than I would, that I thought that they would be. Um, I, I think not, Agreed. I think this spread is way too much delay for, for the Los Angeles Rams on the road here. Really? All right, well, all right. one, that, one that probably could be a bit more interesting then would be Jacksonville at Houston. Um, confidence, maybe dropping the Texans a little bit week to week. Andy, you shouted out there 150 to one. Yeah. Right. Sch- <laughs> scheduling <laughs> easing up a little bit. Um, they are, they were minus seven, uh, initially they're, they're now minus six and a half the totals at 54. Um, Eric, I'll go to you because I know you like Houston back in week three. I think it was, are you, are you still sticking with them here? It's tough. I mean, <laughs> I, I had a Deshaun Watson over two and a half touchdown prop that, and then the over the, the, the early For the season. Week. Uh, yeah, 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 right, right. And the, and the, the, what was it? I had 54. I had a bad number on the over in that game. So that, that was a, a, a costly drop by Will Fuller at the end of the game. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I expected more out of Jacksonville. Yeah. I expected more out of both of these teams yesterday. Um, didn't get it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think this number might be too much, but, um, 
but at some point Houston Houston is more talented than Jacksonville it's, and Deshaun Watson you know the Jacksonville doesn't rush the passer very well and we saw that with Burrow came into the game leading the league in sacks taken and he was pretty comfortable yesterday so if that carries over it, it might be to it, it might it might be just the right number frankly so I took a little plus we took a little plus seven um, minus 117 I think probably just an hour or two ago, but uh, that's a number. I mean, I make it four and a half. I think, I mean, Houston, Houston has been, they've been bad, but they've also, they haven't been especially fortunate. They're uh, Mm -hmm. where they, they're second to last in the NFL in terms of um, their turnover EPA. So I have them losing 20 and a half points due to turnovers. And by the way, my, my interception EPA is a little bit different than most people. So that, that's going to be understating it because I, I compare it. I compare the EPA on an interception to if, if the pass had been incomplete rather than if the play hadn't happened. Um, and I don't, I mean, it's because I do it the same way for fumbles, right? Like I say, okay, you gain three yards and then you fumble or, you yeah. know, or if you're sacked and fumble, I'm comparing it to just being sacked. But, um, but Jacksonville has been, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, it's not all luck, obviously, but like half of that 9.6 of that for Houston's been interceptions and the fumble luck, you know, 6.6 points um, on regular plays and 4.3 points on special teams plays. So um, the fumble luck stuff there is, is you know, going to gonna regress very, very strongly, I would think. But, um, yeah, I think that it's I, – I, I think I'm just a little bit higher on Jacksonville um, than a lot of people. And partly – that's partly going to be, I mean, because of priors. But um, the other part there is going to be – well, and part of – well, the fact that – their their massive sell off of players that the team rating isn't accounting for, but I still think, um, you know, Houston played a very poor game last. I mean, against Minnesota, I had them number nineteen, um, and I actually thought Jacksonville against Cincinnati played. Uh, they graded out as the number thirteen game, best game grade of, of the week. So actually, I had them grading five points better than than Houston. Kind of somewhat surprisingly, they were um, they were ninety fourth percentile in in offensive yards per play and. 96th percentile in play success. So um, they just, I'm actually curious why they, uh, why they played, why, how they, how they lost um, given. Bur- Burrow was, so. Burrow was good. Like I wanted to ding him. I said something re- I wrote down in my notes yesterday. It was like, this was Burrow's maybe his best game. Like he, he had an efficient game. He looked good. He looked great at times, like really for what I've seen so far. And I wanted to ding Jacksonville for losing, for giving up that many points, but, Burrow played well, yeah. and I mean he he spread the ball around, and uh, at the same time Houston kind of was the opposite on offense. You said some of the luck they've had, but just I don't I don't know if getting Bill O'Brien involved in the play calling was a good <laughs> idea. They were already kind of struggling with things, and they went like three for ten or three for twelve on third downs, like just yeah. every everything every high leverage point where there was a third down or they needed to they needed to get a drive to continue. Like they they're not. They're not getting at what everyone else is getting to hit the over. Like they're not getting their drives continued somehow. I don't know if there's a luck factor involved in that, but they're not getting penalties to give them first downs. They, yeah, they were terrible on third down. They had six points at halftime against a defense that has been beat up and down the field by everybody else who's played them pretty much. Just the only t- reason Indy didn't score, they had some bad red zone regression. Andy probably should have scored like 40 points on him. It was it was a really weird game. I was feeling really anxious about my over in that one. Thankfully, you know, Delvin Cook and uh, the Minnesota running offense got uh, got things going, and that did come through in the end. But yeah, that, that was a weird game. I didn't like watching most of that. Yeah, and yeah don't, I, don't, t- and don't take Houston 150 at all to win it. That's don't. Think. No, I think I, I think I, Watson's I, yeah. I think Watson's playing a middle of the pack sort of quarterback right now, which is not what Houston needs to be successful. You know, he need you know they're they're paying him to be a top five. You know, and I think long term he's probably in that conversation. But currently, the way everything is constructed, it it's just it's just difficult to back him laying a touchdown. You know, at this point. Um, yeah. So, you know, Minshew, Minshew played better yesterday than he played on that Thursday night game. Um, but, you know, you're, you're talking about two teams. This is this feels like way more of a coin flip to me, you know, relative to that number um, than than either side having an edge. Completely agree. Yeah, I wouldn't bet this with Eric's money. Well, oh, wait, oh, coin flip. I, I mean, mean this, a coin this, flip this, of a game. Never mind, never mind. No, 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 I mean, no, no like, it's a getting, coin flip getting, of the number. Getting I, I think a cheap it's seven isn't the worst thing. Yeah, six and a half, I think you're, you're, I think, 
six and a half. It's 50, 50 either side. I think I'll put, it, I'll put it this way. If the number was six and a half on Sunday, I wouldn't be betting it there. I'm betting yeah. it now. Cause you know, there hasn't been the same price discovery in the market. And, and, but, but I really do think like I had the Jags is a really, really highly rated offensive team last week. I mean, or their, their performance. So it's interesting looking like both teams, as you said, like that was the, that was a game where, like, that was the three for nine in the red zone game, right? But yeah, they were they were two were, for five. And both, yeah, both teams were above ninety fifth or above ninetieth percentile on, on all my offensive metrics except scoring, um, and and lower than fifth percentile on all the defensive metrics. So it was a bit of a frenetic ending there. I think there was five scoring drives in the fourth quarter. One was probably a overlap from the third, but that game was that game was something to take in. And I thought Jacksonville would play better off extra rest and I guess I'm glad I didn't back them. Well, I'm, I'll, I'm I'll, not glad I did. <laughs> I'll get us on to the next game. We've got the Cardinals up against the Jets. Uh, a bit of interest in the Jets so far. Again, they've dropped from plus seven and a half to the flat seven. Uh, total is currently at 47. Uh, I think I know where we're going to go first here. Oh, no. <laughs> do you like to this number? Yes, yeah, so like the roof is on the travel news. Like, do, does anybody know? Is Arizona going back to Arizona? I don't know. I've heard and both reports, and I don't know right now. Do you think it helps them or hurts them? Well, th- there's people. I'm getting like random DMs from people without even you know Twitter pictures. I don't know how much you can trust something like that, but they're saying the rules are if you stay on the East Coast, you can't leave your hotel room. Like, well, who would do that? If that is true, who would do that? You you give up all your practices just to not travel? So I don't know what's true or not. I got guys checking Instagram from Cardinals players to see if they were taking pictures back home yet. Yeah, nobody knows anything. I think that makes a big deal if they travel or not. Yeah, you're right. I mean, obviously, that that'll. I mean, a big deal on the order of, like, maybe a half a point, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, that's a big deal. Seven. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, a generic half point. Yes. So a quarter point around the seven. But yeah, I uh, I like the Jets. I hate to say it, even though I had them as the worst graded team last <laughs> week. And, and you know, watching that Jets-Denver game, I was like, I felt like, you know, the Jets deserve to cover there. Um, but then I look at my game grades, which said that the Broncos were like 13 points, 13 and a half points better. Um, although that controls for home field advantage. So well, the, yeah, uh, it's it hasn't been pretty. It wasn't like the yeah. The only thing the Jets were good at was convert like last week was converting yards into points, and that's because they didn't get very many yards. Well, that you know they got short. So how how does your? I mean, you don't have to give this away, but like penalties. I mean, I think the Jets had. There are two types of penalties. There are penalties of you know that are dumb, and then there are penalties that are just part of playing the game. I feel you know the Jets had a lot of like predictably dumb penalties that that cost them you know significant yards but then they came back and got three interceptions that were you know short in the field and in one case you know resulted in a touchdown that um you know obviously i think if you if if they didn't get that the broncos kind of win the game going away um like how does how did i mean how are those resolved i mean i would assume that that puts that's that's what's accounting for you know the broncos looking so much better um the Bron- I mean, the fact that the Broncos, well, I, I mean, I'm literally looking at like the yards per play and play success stuff and, and the Jets were way outperformed by Denver. I agree. Like, the, like watching, you know, all those dumb penalties, you know, the Jets were penalized 24 more yards than the Broncos, but you're right. It wasn't, it wasn't just the yardage. It was the timing of it, the third, you know, and so um, on like, you know, the turnover, I mean, I, I'd say that the, the turnover luck outweighs the penalty stuff though. Have you run this with Flacco in? Um, no, is Flacco going to be playing? Well, I mean, Darnold has, and that, that's the other thing. So the, this is a game where I probably would lean Jets. It's a lot of points at home, especially if we do have to have Arizona doing some screwy travel. And honestly, Arizona, I didn't grade them very high off their game last week either. I'm, nope. I'm really disappointed, actually, as someone who was hoping that team would take a step forward. But here it is. Ian Rappaport from about a couple hours ago. It's, yeah, it's the AC joint sprain in his throwing shoulder. He kind of played through it, which maybe Flacco would have come in and backdoored it for you. So you can be mad at Darnold. But it says, it says here, like, missing time is the most likely scenario. But again, we're sitting here at, 
you know, two fifteen Eastern on a Monday where teams are putting together like these pretend injury reports. Like if we did practice, this is, is who would practice. So I don't know how I trust that. Like right now with, with the uncertainty of the Arizona travel, not even knowing who the starter is for the jets. Like I, I'm staying away from this and I would bet we see some moves once we find out if it's Flacco. I don't know how much of a downgrade that is. Yeah, where do you think that line goes if it's Flacco? <laughs> I think it stays pat. It might not move. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's about a, it's a lateral move. Here here's my and here a long term play, I think, if you're if you're wanting to like a, a, a bets to make in the future. And unless obviously I'm not rooting against your bet, Rufus, but the Ariz, if Arizona were to blow out New York, I think fading Arizona the rest of the season would be plus E V because Arizona had what a lot of people thought was an impressive win against San Francisco week one. Um that one was a little bit noisy. They played Washington, and I think Washington was was awful. And then over the past two weeks, we sort of seen them regress. Um, but a lot of people are high on Arizona and sort of clinging to those priors a little bit. If you know, I don't necessarily know if they're if, if the spread here is warranted for them. But if they do cover it, I think Arizona is going to be a pretty like trendy team. Uh, you know, over the next few weeks. And, you know, to me, I think Kyler Murray right now is playing like Teddy Bridgewater with some wheels. And, and that to me means that he's overvalued in the marketplace. Yeah. That's a, it's a bad combo for a team. If they get behind, like they, they aren't able to stop the run. Carolina ran for a lot, like a dozen first downs on them. I, I bet they ran the ball like 30 times. Like just, well, and their, li- just their linebackers are just an, an yeah. atrocity. And their safeties, a Buda Baker being out, their safeties can't play. Um, and then the other issue, and you know, on their on their offensive side of the ball, they just they they can't produce throws in the 10 to 19 range. They're deep, they throw deep shots or they throw stuff underneath, which to your point, Andy, they did that that's really difficult to come back from when you're behind. And and the offensive line's probably still a decent sized liability when you're down and everybody's knows you're throwing every down. It's, it's no fun to have a bad offensive line. That's like you said, the, the drive killers, that's the only way you're going to find sacks in this league right now is a T everybody knows you're throwing it and you have a bad line. I don't well, even see how many times uh, you're sacked. Next we've got uh Philadelphia traveling to Pittsburgh. Uh, I think the Eagles probably been a bit of a disappointment for most people, but then they obviously got the win at the 49ers at the weekend. Um, Pinnacle has them as a, a seven and a half point underdog here. Uh, they did open at plus seven, and the total was also dropped forty six, just down to forty five. Um, does anyone think the market's off for this one? Are the are the Eagles going to tempt people in again? Do you think? You know, gun to my head, I, I take the Steelers there. Actually, I make it eight point eight, but I'm, I'm not I'm not taking anything. Yeah, I, I I'm with Rufus here. I think that. Pitts, as I talk about Pittsburgh's defense being vulnerable against Kansas City, it's the exact opposite against a team without wide receivers, which is what Philly is. Um, and, and and their offensive line's banged up. They, you know, in hindsight, they just caught a team, I think, that was, you know, primed to be upset last night in the Nick Mullins led San Francisco team. So, um, you know, Philadelphia's reign as the leader in the NFC East, I think, lasts a week. By the way, I mean, Jeffrey might be back this week. Yeah, but it, Jeffrey's know. like Jeffrey's like a cheeseburger away from replacing, you know, uh, their left tackle, as opposed to being any Calvin, sort of threat Calvin for them. too. Yeah, yeah, like I, yeah, I mean, uh, Jeffrey was very effective in their Super Bowl year, but since then he he hasn't been exactly somebody who can. Say, and Wentz is having so many accuracy issues that he really needs receiver. Like the guys that are going to make. Receivers. Yeah, the guys that are going to make him make him money, I think, are the Jalen Ragers and the and the Deshaun mm-hmm. Jacksons. I, I think Jeffrey re- requires more accuracy than what Wentz is currently producing. And we we said that last night. Like, how dire is this? Your wide receiver one is your punt returner. Like, they almost they must have not had like any other options. What if he gets banged up on a punt return? I mean, I mean you're, you're, you're putting you're putting running backs in the slot at that point. You could say that with the Chiefs some games. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, that's so. fair. I thought you were just going to say Greg Ward. I was. I, I mean, I, I think just saying Greg Ward is 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 a little bit more. Uh, I know, but it's it's great. It is Greg Ward. But like, if I if I had the team that was that banged up, that that made me nervous, and I was betting the other side. But uh, yeah, like like Eric said, even if Alshon's back, you need yeah Rager. The injury's a little longer. Uh, Deshaun, what are we looking at? Another. Uh, I haven't even updated that. I just he's not back this week. Yeah. Like that's not that's not a possibility. And yeah, if there's a cheap seven, I've been high on Pittsburgh all year. In fact, I have I have a, 
uh, several outrights. I have a bet that they win more games than the Eagles. So this is an important one, I guess. And at the same time, yeah, all the matchups are going to be Pittsburgh plus. Like against a beat up offensive line, you have two great pass rushers. You have depth in the in the in the the entire secondary. I'm trying to find like Philadelphia's plus here. I guess Wentz doing some, you know, whatever you want to call it. It was like Russell Wilson esque, a little escape artist shit here and there. I mean, he, he can do that, but at the same time, he did it against a defense that's been beat up. Pittsburgh's defense has been re- and it's like Pittsburgh off a bye. And yeah, it's, kind gonna, of a, it's a weird, it's a weird way to do it, but yeah, they, they're essentially off a bye here. I'm giving them credit, full credit for a bye. I don't yeah, know. They, are you guys doing the same thing? Yeah, they didn't have COVID. I mean, they the game was canceled for the other team. They yeah. they've been just as soon as they said we're not playing this game, Tomlin is on to prepping for Philadelphia, and yeah, they they probably are plus in every single matchup. I'm trying to. Maybe coaching. I don't love Tomlin, but at you the same time, Dougie, Dougie hasn't impressed me for a while now. Probably a neutral coaching matchup. I mean, I love I love Tomlin despite the fact that he isn't always right with the analytics. It just seems like he just he seems like a good leader who is, just inspires his team. I think the I think the players like him. Yeah, I think for sure. And he's from me. Like I remember when he was uh, Eric. You remember this? He was in Minnesota. He was uh, the DC for one year. Yeah, he was yep, the he was here. The, the Vikings have let a lot of Super Bowl winning coaches leave. Tony Dungy was our DC. Brian Bill is the offense coordinator. Um, the, the Washington yeah. football team has allowed a lot of Super Bowl losing coaches to leave. <laughs> Two and yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I, I I agree. I think Tomlin. I think Tomlin, as far as as the analytics are concerned, is a little bit behind. But he is a good leader of men, and it's clear that like. You know, if, if you grade out all the players and you look at what Pittsburgh should be winning, they do win more than they should. Um, so I don't know what that is uh, as far as it's that, if that's chemistry or noise or what. But um, he's somebody who, you know, for for all the, you know, for all the praise that Doug Peterson gets, I don't know if he actually is an edge here. I mean, you look at like Andy Reid and what he's done relative to his in-game analytical decisions over his career, right? And his time and man- clock management. I mean, we can, it's easy to grade <laughs> someone on that stuff. Like, cause it's the stuff you see, but it's the stuff you don't see in the locker room that affects how the team plays that like, pro- like makes up the majority of coaching. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. Somebody with the longevity he has, you have to give him some credit there. Just he's, he's stuck around. They've had, I'm trying to think of like the last really bad Pittsburgh team. I don't wait. Didn't they not? I th- what was the record last year? Eight, well, eight. I mean, last eight, year you got to give him a pass. Hasn't he never course, had obviously. a losing season? Never. I remember had, that. Never had a losing season. He made his worst season. Like, yep. that's just, like, the stability, like, the, the level-headedness, whatever required. I don't know. It's impressive. Right, I'm going to get us on to uh, Cincinnati at Baltimore. Big minus 13 and a half on the Ravens here. We, we kind of talked about that pretty poor show against the Chiefs, or whether that was just maybe the, the Chiefs playing exceptionally well. Um, but they then bounce back against Washington. Um, I'm assuming everyone's probably still got the Ravens at the, the number two team in the league at the moment, but it's, it is a big number to take on them. Wait, um, you mean behind the Saints? Behind the uh, Steelers, yep, right there. Um, <laughs> you've also got a, a total of 52 to work with if you want to as well. So, Andy, I'll go to you first on this one. Do you, do you fancy taking any of these numbers or, or do you think they're right? That's probably fair. But, I mean, if I made it, that, and that's the thing. I made it 13 and a half on the road, road, road field advantage, negligible. It gets probably pretty close. Like I said, I was impressed with Burrow, but again, it wasn't against a defense of this caliber. Wow. Baltimore felt like they were running a scrimmage at times, like diving into, go dive into that box score. That's an ugly one too. It's like, just, uh, I don't feel like they were really playing to, you know, blow a team out. It's not like we saw at the beginning of last season where they'd put up 59 on well, who was at the start of, I think Miami in the first week. Like it, it just felt that was like, that wasn't a fun game to watch. It wasn't really a fun game to have the 13 and a half in, even though we, like, I knew it was on the right side of the number. They were up late. Uh, the garbage touchdown probably skewed it a little. Like they, they clearly won, but at the same time, we didn't see the best of Baltimore. If they get pushed here, We'll probably see a little better. I think this total's probably in in danger. I wouldn't I wouldn't bet the under here. Like Cincinnati is every week we see this. Cincinnati's like the this never die team that's just going to keep slinging it late. And if Baltimore gets a big lead, the total probably gets backdoored by Burrow. I'm not laying this points here. Uh, I'd probably make it a little less, but at the same time, 
got it. Am I going to say I want to take Cincinnati? I'd almost take Cincinnati here. I'd have to run that. I haven't fully uh, <clears throat> looked at this game. It's pretty close to taking them. Really? I make – yeah, I, I have it about 12 and a half. I mean, I, I think and, – and I don't know how much we're really incorporating Burrow. You know, it, it, obviously, I think the first three weeks, his statistics were a lot less impressive than, you know, our impression of him. Um, but I uh, but I think he did – He you know, after last week, I mean, we have him we, we have him with less than 10% of throws and drawbacks being negatively graded. Um, only 2% of his drawbacks produce a turnover-worthy play. I mean, those are the things that I think, you know, you could really cling to if you're trying to back, uh, you know, a young quarterback getting this many points. Um, you know, it, it's that lack of variance. And um, so I, I think Cincinnati is the only side. I'm not huge. I don't think I don't make the number like seven or something like that where you know, there's a huge edge there. But um, I, I, I don't think I can lay it with Baltimore. That's for sure. You know, I, I'm going to echo what you guys said. Like, if if I had to take a team, I'd take Cincinnati here. I make it 12.7, so not not a real edge. Um, divisional matchup, smaller home field. Um, but I, I actually still thought the Ravens graded out very highly last week. I mean, they only had one red zone trip. But that, they still, that part was wild when I saw that. But I still had them as the third best um, graded team, just, just um, with the Massey Peabody numbers, and they graded out. 18 and a half points better than the Washington team. So, um, you know, I agree. It, it's the kind of game where like with the game script, they didn't have to like late in the game, I think was, I, I'm sure there was de-weighted stuff in there as a result of that, which is influencing the grade being as high. Um, but yeah, Cincinnati or nothing for me. Well, Eric, you mentioned there about the, the, the contrast between maybe the impression of Burrow and, and what you've actually seen in the numbers, like how much for you of it, are you eye testing any of these this stuff, or are you, are you purely basing it on the data that you've got after what four games? Well, like I w- I was on Cincinnati plus six in week two of Thursday night football, and so like you know that in that game you know they he he threw the ball a ton, came through the back door, covered the number f- for betters, and I think people came out of that game saying, "Wow, Joe, Joe Burrow is the next great thing." You know, everybody who's a, a Bengals fan should be happy. And you go back and look and you're like, well, he averaged what less than six yards or pass attempt. And so like for me, like that, that contrast is something that was real early in the, or, you know, they tie a game against Philadelphia, but you go back and look and that offense wasn't actually all that efficient against a pretty bad, poor defense. Like this was, I think the first week where you look and you're like, okay, this is actually an offense that really did move the football. And, you know, it, the statistics sort of matched up with perception uh, for him. Um, that being said, like, you know, the Bengals haven't had anything, you know, I, I can understand the perception coming in and being like, okay, Burrow, Burrow's the first thing that Bengals fans can be excited about since like 2015. So I don't necessarily blame anybody, but it's, it's kind of was the reality through three weeks. Yeah. He threw the ball, like just the, the volume. That's the thing. Like, I think people were impressed because of the numbers and you don't look at the volume. I'm looking now, Dak, Jesus Christ, Dak has 200 attempts. Mm-hmm. Through four games, that's a lot. Uh, but Burrow, Burrow, 177 attempts through four games. Didn't he have like almost 60 against the Browns? I think he did what have did 60. He, yeah. 60. He had like 25 pass attempts from empty in that game, like just yeah. from five wide receiver sets. It's like, um, yeah, they've been throwing an astronomical amount. You get you get impressed just by volume, and then you if you go back and look at like Eric said, the pass uh, what is it yardage per attempts was pretty dang low. And you start looking into a little deeper. It's like, oh, you just throwing the ball. A, you get a the monster I amount. Had, I mean, I graded their offense like really, really low, um, which is why I like Jacksonville partly this past week. Um, they hadn't had a single offensive performance that was below the bottom third, I don't believe, going into uh, this past week's game. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that I think that was a statistical reality that a lot of people who had back because he was what two zero and one against the number. So people people who are betting him were getting positive confirmation bias but yeah and that was sort of like what led i think um although jacksonville took a ton of money right that number came off three and a half and finished at what one and a half so um yeah. you know the people i think people had the same idea as you including me i took jacksonville last week um but uh you know i think the recreate you know recreational people for example i think we're very much looking at uh you know burrow as being like the next great thing but she may be yeah, well, that and what? Yeah, I think I think I think for rookie for young quarterback, <laughs> rookie. 
yeah. for young quarterbacks, it's really important to, to to untangle. So like Baker Mayfield was the same thing two years ago. It, it's really it's really important to untangle good from encouraging because encouraging is probably where the bar should be. Whereas good is, I think, if so, if a player becomes encouraging as a rookie passer, then we immediately crown them as good, which is probably too much. And and we see that re- that second year regression many times. Right. Yeah. Let, uh, we just yeah we just talked about Arizona. Yeah, we'll get onto the the Giants taking on the Cowboys now. It's it's another one pushing double digits. We're at minus nine and a half on Dallas. Uh, total is currently fifty four. Um, I'm not, Dallas. Yeah, I'm not too sure. Same. I'm not too That's sure. such an interesting yeah. team. Um, go on then, Rufus. What what's going on with the well, Cowboys? It's so you know I had them graded bottom third this past week, but I mean their offense was. Great. Their, their, their defense, literally, I'm looking at the percentile grade here, and it's I'm looking, it's 0. 0.0. I got to add a, de- a decimal here to see how far. Zero, <laughs> so 0. 0. 0.05th percentile grade for defense on play success last That's week. Bad. That's, Cleveland was successful on 70.2% of their offensive plays. That's a ridiculously high number. Um, the Cow- but the Cowboys have had, like, they've been unfortunate, and I think obviously you can tell based on this, the number we're seeing that the market still thinks they're like, you know, at least a decent team. Um, I mean, they've, they've, their turnover EPA has been negative 25 points, which is worse than the league by five points over Houston. They're, um, they've, well, you know, I'd, I'd heard the narrative their defense has been put in bad positions, um, you know, due to turnovers in terms of shorter fields, but actually they, they've been pretty middle of the pack there. But, um, you know, they've lost six of seven fumbles. Like they're, I mean, I think it's clear that they're not a – I mean, well, their defense seems – their offense is good. I think we all agree, yeah. right? And it, they'll, like with Dak Prescott, they'll still be an elite offense. But but the defense, like Mike Nolan is defensive coordinator. Look at his track record. Like he's – I don't think he's been the defensive coordinator of a team that's been like better than like 26th in the like NFL um, yeah. defensively since, you know, in the last 10 years. So um, – I don't know if that's McCarthy's loyalty to Mike Nolan. Um, probably that's good old boys. Um, but it's uh, that that's the question to me. Like, what is the Dallas defense going to actually end up being and with all the injuries they have? Um, like, I feel like they need, they need a better defensive coordinator, better scheme. And Eric, um, you can obviously talk a lot more about, um, about what they're doing on defense, but I, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that. I mean, personally, this game, I, I make the, I don't have an opinion. I make the number nine. Yeah, Nolan has never looked good in some of the work that I've done to try to untangle defensive performance from the the players. I mean, you look at Trayvon Diggs, the second round pick out of Alabama, has given up the second most first downs in his coverage this year. Um, that that's not encouraging. They, you know, Demarcus Lawrence has not played well. Their linebackers are a, a mess. What I'll say though, and I and I, this is one thing like uh, what I really appreciated about you know talking to people who you know you know, who are wagering, you know, on these games all the time, like d- defense doesn't matter as much when the offense across from it can't execute. And so I agree with almost everything that people say about Dallas defense. They're terrible. They, they're, you know, they, they can't stop. They can't stop anybody when they execute, but are the New York giants, a team that can ex- like, is this game about the offenses? Because the giants defense isn't very good at all. They're weak in a number of places where Dallas is strong. Um, they don't rush the passer very well, which plays exactly into uh, Dallas's weakness on offense. You know, as far as mitigating it, and Daniel Jones and you know they 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 can't run the ball the way Cleveland can. Um, you know, without Barkley, but also with kind of a crappy O line. And the and Dan, Danny, you know, Daniel Jones has not shown the ability to make other teams pay when coverage is weak on the back end. So is this a, is this a, like, I, I hate the phrase defense doesn't matter, but is this in a situation where defense matters way less than what we think it does? Yeah, you're not, there's no way, like just to Rufus's stats there about how he graded out the successful plays. You're just, there's not the, you don't have the roster in New York to be doing that. Like it's wild looking at, they threw and, you know, Landry threw for a 37 yard, which honestly, that was a great throw. He, he, Jarvis, he that was a he hose. unloaded yeah, on that yeah. thing. That was a goddamn laser. But you, what do you, you add that up? It's like 200 yards passing 
When's the last time somebody put up pert near a 50 burger with 200 yards passing? Just everything they did worked. They got uh, two turnovers and were in decent positions. Like Rufus saying, the, the defense got put in a bad position. The defense got put in a bad position by being on the field. Like it's just, It doesn't matter what position they're in. They have weaknesses everywhere. And a uh, team, I guess, maybe I'm a Stefanski believer. I didn't mind him. I think we maybe didn't get to see the best of him under Mike Zimmer. Because he kind of he kind of puts the holster on an offense the way he likes to run his ship, and maybe this is going to be a really fun offense, and we're going to look back at this game and be like, well, shit, that's that was kind of the coming out party, and this Cleveland offense can move, and you know it's just been a coaching issue for years. Dallas, and then at Dallas at the same time, they were down by three points somehow with like four minutes left. Like this, this defense or this offense is amazing at times. I don't know quite what was going on in that second quarter. Obviously, I think that's where both of the turnovers were. Um, I, th- yeah. I think the turnover margin was just two nothing, and it was maybe even on concurrent drives there, where like or consecutive that they turned the ball over. They didn't score in the second and third quarters. I'm sure yeah. negative three turnover margin. Um, but oh yeah, the, I- there, there there was uh, two fumbles and then the pick. Yep. I mean, like it's mine might be wrong. No, you're right. It's yeah. two two fumbles and a pick. Yeah, I, th- I mean, this is clearly this is clearly a first order statement, and obviously not true once you get to like the the second orders. But like, I the a, a phrase that I like is like when offense executes, defense doesn't matter that much. And I think that I think that the Browns executed an offensive game plan to almost to perfection. The only thing that and and it was without their best running back again. Like Dearness Johnson played in the AAF and somehow had 95 yards yesterday. Um, <laughs> the but the 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 do the or sorry do the Giants are the Giants capable of executing in such a way? Like I just don't think so. I mean, and they don't push edges. Like McCarthy hasn't been perfect so far, but he like yesterday the reason that they were down three was because he went for the two two point conversions when he's down nineteen. Now that seems trivial to us, but it's not in the NFL. Like and, that's an obvious one, even for like I would think even for NFL coaches. Yeah, you yeah. you'd think right, but that's it, not though, and uh, or it, it's it's they don't act as uh, as though it is. Um, and whereas Joe Judge is a punt, he's a. I mean, yesterday he kicked a field goal when they were down ten six in the red zone, like in the fourth yeah. quarter of that game. So like you you even just basic strategy, uh, McCarthy's lapse, you know the the Joe Judge and, and Jason Garrett. So I think this is one where, and again, this is somewhat narrative driven, but I think Dallas is, I think this is a Dallas or, or nothing for me I, as, as far as a bet's concerned. We said that last night, like ooh, it was going to be, you got to just kind of wipe this game off and realize like how good this offense is, and they're not facing the Browns again. It, I mean, it's the Giants. It's at home. It's kind of a bad home, like home field historically, and obviously this year's yeah. quite different. But at the same time, it's still the Giants with the well, rookie and head coach. Divisional matchup, so yeah. yeah, that that's that is taking away from it a little bit. But it is it's a divisional matchup where the two head coaches are different than they were a season ago. So there's a little bit less familiarity than normal. But what about um, Dallas knowing? I mean, I guess you do have a different coaching staff, but but at the same time, you have J- you know Jason Garrett is the offensive yeah. coordinator for the I Giants. Think, so that's plus for Dallas. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's my whole thing. Is I I think things that would sh- otherwise shrink the spread here are probably going to make it grow in Dallas's favor. Um, you know, unfortunately for for unfortunately for New York. Um, the other thing when you look at Dallas, you look at the offenses they face. The Rams are a pretty good offense when they and. And obviously Seattle's ter- terrific. The Browns, I think, are an emerging team with one blip in week one. Uh, and the Falcons, as I think people will find out tonight, are a pretty damn good offense. So th- this is probably the first time they're going to face kind of a, a crappy offensive team. And I think that our, our opinion of their defense, whether right or wrong, is going to you know change a little bit after Sunday. And Eric, I actually just pulled this up because I feel like I was kind of talking out of my ass a little bit on some of this stuff, like saying their defense was bad just based on some of these metrics. But they're actually... They're in middle of the pack in terms of yards per play allowed. They've just been bad on third. They've been very bad yep. on. I mean, their success rate on um, on third and fourth down against is fifty two percent. Although, you know, to be fair, it's forty nine percent on early downs, and and they have they have the fourth lowest uh, yards to go for opponents on third down. So it's not like, um, it's, but I guess they're they're not giving up the explosive plays is what that says to me a little bit. Although. It does look like a couple. they've given up. Well, well, they're not giving up the big runs. 
They've given up eight big passes. That's definitely more than the yeah. average. The, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there are some like weirdnesses in their data. The Trayvon Diggs knocking the ball at the back of the end zone is an EPA swing that's that, that's reflected in success rate, but not. Um, or well, it, it's weird. Yeah, that, that was an oddity. But they they are giving up gash plays uh, in the passing game as evidenced by the the Trayvon Diggs stat. But also week one, you know, week one is another interesting game where they were. Um, you know, the other team, you know, the Rams were mostly getting successful plays, but not big plays. And that's why that game sort of, what did it go? 17, 13 or 2017. I can't remember what the score was. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not, they're not void of talent defensively. They just haven't, they've, they've had some bad luck and then they played some teams that can capitalize on it, you know, specifically Russell Wilson and Matt Ryan. It's funny to say they've had bad luck when we remember that that base, you know, the fumble going yeah. to the end zone, DK yeah. Metcalf, which it would they would be like off the charts bad luck if it wasn't for that. Yep. Right. Well, we'll move on. We've got a couple of interesting games just to finish up with. We've got Indianapolis traveling to Cleveland. Um, there's been a bit of action on the Colts that they, they were at the kind of nothing number of, of one early doors and they've, they've pushed all the way out to, to minus two and a half. So maybe that three is coming. Um, the total is sticking at 47. Andy, I'll go over to you for this one. Is it, can you see it getting to three is one thing. And then what would the play be if it did? Yeah, I bet this yesterday at a pick and then I bet some minus one and a half sold out to whatever cheap number it was. Like it was, it seemed like it was off according to everything we read. Even, even with like an upgrade to the Cleveland offense, this is man, you know, like we've, we've said that we've said that. You know, we, we've talked about the indie defense and how it, it hasn't played anybody, but I still have to give it an upgrade. Hard swing, hard swing from uh, getting to play the Dallas defense to playing Indy, even at home. We, we assumed it would go to two and a half, three. I'm fine with the early number. If it keeps going, I might uh, might be on both sides of this. I'd probably make it value at like three and a half, four. It's probably pretty close, but I didn't make the game a pick 'em as it opened. Indy, Indy needs to get a little better on offense, but this defense has been playing well. And uh, I, I guess I'd have to look at my Indy grade. Yeah, it was it was the ugly Bears game again, where I I have trouble downgrading them just off that because of the game script. The whole time they just they just led, and I think what was their what did we say their red zone efficiency was there? Probably pretty nasty. They kicked some one for uh, four. Yeah, one for four. I think the offense can be better. Their their red zone has just been awful all year. Hopefully that uh, regresses to a positive manner. But yeah, that the numbers made me bet this, I suppose, and I'm fine having a cheaper number as it moves on closer to three. It's tickled three plus one hundred in a couple places. Really? Yeah, I I'm a little interested in this because I think at at three obviously if it gets out to three cleveland i think is the only way you can go but i didn't really understand it even at at you know plus one or something like that you know i are we are we is the data still sort of are we overreacting to week one still too much and the fact that cleveland has you know a couple games against crappy teams in washington and cincinnati and then a really poor game against uh baltimore um to you know before we got this week like what was our prior going into the season on Cleveland? It was like what eight and a half was their win total, and Indy was nine or so. Does that, I mean, is that reflected in is that reflected in this number? And how much has really changed, uh, you know, sort of over the last four weeks? That's a good point. In Cleveland, having a new you know a new coach, um, it means I, I you know with with having that shortened off season and everything, and no preseason games. I, I think it's a team that you'd expect to sort of improve as the season goes on. Um, you can say the same thing with Indy though, with Philip Rivers. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have nothing there. I, I make the game minus two. All right. One that, that might be of interest is Minnesota at Seattle. 57 and a half <laughs> on the board. Uh, the market is all for the over on this as well. Um, I'm going to open it up for anyone. Does anyone think it should be lower than where it's at? Where do those rate as far as defensive secondaries for you guys? And bottom five bottom three bottom two i think it depends upon who's playing right if if yeah. jamal adams is playing i think it's a little different right if he doesn't get suspended yeah or or but also like quandre Diggs is somebody who like market like they don't have a nickel right they're playing ugo amadi at nickel which i think is a mismatch um you know for minnesota there um but minnesota's secondary like anybody in the league who has a bad secondary i feel like minnesota's is worse yep 
<laughs> that's that's what baffled me about Houston. Like the the greatest part of the secondary got ejected. Now you're at replacement level just all across it, and Houston still couldn't get back into that game really. I mean, eventually they did have a shot at it, but that, I was just amazed that Houston continued with the game plan they did. You should be able to put up more points than that on Minnesota. Yeah. I mean, but both these teams were – so Seattle was four for six in the red zone. That's six red zone appearances. That's a ton. Like, I see, like looking at that, that was a game that was pretty low scoring most of the way. And I remember looking, it was, I was like, oh, it's going to be potentially one of the two under games in the, yeah. in the early wave. And but, but Seattle was like, I, I have their offensive numbers off the charts last week. Um, you know, 98th percentile in yards per play, like 99.5 percentile for play success, um, six, four for six in the red zone. Minnesota was four for five in the red zone, too. So I think we have a little bit of like, I mean, two, two very good offensive performances. Yeah. All right. What we'll do now is we'll, we'll wrap up. We've got a last game. Uh, Chargers against the Saints. Pinnacles at minus seven and a half uh, on the Saints. 51 and a half point total. Seems like people are confident on the Saints and might be one to split opinion. Is, does anyone think Breeze's arm is, is costing the Saints and they're not as good as people maybe think? I mean, there's ways, there's ways to mask it and you've got a smart coach. One of the best ways of masking it is playing Detroit, though. That and, is, that's fair. And like they're, I, I, the Chargers' defense is banged up for sure, and um, I'm a little concerned that you know what was it? Uh, Keenan Allen had like what 40, 50 percent of Justin Herbert's targets yesterday. Um, but I don't know. Like I, I feel like you know, I feel like you know, Rufus, you were on New Orleans yesterday. I, I eventually got there when it got to three. Um, the I think those are the kind of numbers that New Orleans can cover. I think when it gets out to a touchdown, it's really tricky for a team like that with with Breeze's inability to make the quick strikes. Like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like this is just maybe a point too much. I mean, my my numbers just like they like the Jets every week, like the Saints here. Um, although they, I, I will say they didn't like the Saints the week the Saints played the Raiders somehow. But um, yeah, I I think um, I mean. I, I've said a lot about the Saints in the past. I think they're in, you know, that their defense isn't wasn't as bad in the first three weeks as people gave it credit for. Um, it was you know, penalized and and not good in the higher leverage situations. Um, but they still have an, you know, I still think they have an elite defense and and you know, hopefully, will they be getting Michael Thomas back this week? Uh, yeah, it sounds like there's a chance. Yeah, um, and that really does help them because that that is sort of like the down payment that that offense has. Uh, with drive success every week, right? And with, without him, it's a little bit shakier. But you can see that Breeze is getting a little bit more chemistry with like Emmanuel Sanders, for example, um, who, you know, it, I, I, at least to to my, you know, dumb naked eye. But, yeah. That yeah. was a game both quarterbacks like spread. I, I want to say it was like 20 guys were targeted. And I think Sanders was the only one who had. Uh, everybody, I wrote that down. Yeah, everybody, nobody had more than four targets except for Emmanuel Sanders. So, I mean, he's going to have to get some some chemistry going with him if Michael Thomas is going to be hurt for extended period of time. That's the that's the second piece you went and got. If you want this offense to move, it can't just be all Kamara. And at the same time, the defense, I'm, I'm wishy washy on that. Wait, why are you wishy washy on their defense? I I liked him at the beginning. Some of the metrics grayed out where it's like, yeah, this is this is still a good defense. But at the same time, let's I guess let's talk about the team as a whole closing with a lead. Like they continued to let, and I guess I like Detroit's offense, so maybe I, I can't uh, ding them as hard on that. But letting Detroit get back in that game after they kind of took control of it wasn't a great look. And at the same time, if you wash out some of those, you know, garbage yards from Detroit, that defense probably played pretty well. At the same time, I'm not laying seven and a half. You know, I probably I'm I'm gonna hope to lay seven, but I mean the defense I bet, what? I mean their defense one. I'm showing one, two, three, fifth in adjusted yards per play so far this season. They've been very, very good against the run, three and a half yards per running back rush. Um actually I'm not sure how I mean that's that is good, but it's um yeah, I mean they were, they were very good on third down against the Lions, and I think that's part of what skews it too. The Lions were like, wait, but perfect. their plays they were perfect on fourth down. So here's the thing. Here's why I think this. I mean, the Saints overall have given up um, a where is it fifty one percent play success rate 
to opposing teams on third down and fourth down, which is puts them one, two, three, fifth worst in the NFL, despite being fifth best in the NFL in yards per play against. So they've been, to me, that says they've been doing worse in the higher leverage situations. Yeah. They've been on they should regress. And they should Here's be. Right. At the end of the season, I thought they were going to be a fantastic defense. Um, they've been a little, the Saints have been a little lucky over on, uh, lucky overall on turnovers, you know, plus 10 um, points on turnovers. But, um, and that's with Taysom Hill touching the ball sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they should. I think he fumbled again. I don't think he he didn't lose it. I didn't catch a ton of that game. I dove into it a little, but yeah, I think you're right. Hopefully, with a with a better defense, it's playing better. Maybe you won't have such bad luck. Like, yeah, I just I pulled up the Lions were three for three on fourth down. Like that's yeah. if you can keep drives alive, that's how you get garbage points. That's how you let a team back into it. Maybe I was too hard on it. I, so thanks and that's, for, that's for the, talking me off the ledge. Well, no, and that's the narrative. Like, oh, that's a defense that can't get yeah. off the field, you know. But yeah. but we've seen, you know, we've like I think the analytics crowd out there knows that like first and second down generally are just as predictive as third down in terms of predicting future third down stuff. So yeah, and, or, and I think I think the tricky part with this particular season is. You know, I, I do agree that I think the Saints fundamentally are going to be a good defense this year. The my only my only concern is that I won I don't know how if if that weight is smaller in twenty twenty than in other seasons. All right. Well let's uh let's call it there, guys. We we got through the slate. We did better than last week. Um, but that is all we got the time for today. Uh special thanks, Eric, Andy, and Rufus. Appreciate you coming on. Uh great insight, interesting analysis, and yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for tuning in, wherever you may be. Uh, you can get all the latest odds that we've discussed on the show today on Pinnacle.com. And remember to always gamble responsibly.